when people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. That's a very natural thing. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. But it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's how far Mars is away from us. So when we first get word that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive and dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, is referred to as the seven minutes of terror because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing and one that we had never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping 9 Gs. At that point, we have to get that heat shield off. It's like a big lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off and then come down in rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just gonna smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical divert maneuver. We fly off to the side. Diverting away from the parachute, killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. And we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six kilometer high mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky crane on the rover. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels on the surface. As the rover touches down and is now on the ground, the descent stage is in a collision course with the rover. We must cut the bridle immediately and fly the descent stage to a safe distance from the rover.
Welcome back, everyone, to the second session in our Women on Mars series. For those of you joining us online, welcome to this very special event hosted at the Sydney Opera House. Now, we're in the Sydney Opera House with girls from about 30 different high schools. So, girls, would you make some noise? <laughs> sure. I'd also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we meet today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and also to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, this morning was all about reaching into space, and this afternoon we're going to hear from speakers who will help us explore and understand the universe. Now, science move, um, things move really quickly in science, and unfortunately, Dr. Abigail Allwood will not be joining us this afternoon. She's not very well and is disappointed she will not be able to join us. But lucky for you, scientists um, adapt really quickly. And our next speaker, Dr. Mitch Schulte, will, um, will speak to Abigail's slides. So the video you just watched is the perfect introduction for our next speaker. Um, Mitch Schulte is program scientist with the Mars Exploration Program at NASA headquarters in Washington, DC. He is the geochemist currently working on the Mars 2020 mission and the US contribution to the European Space Agency's ExoMars 2020 mission. Please welcome Mitch to tell us more about successfully landing on Mars. Thank you uh, and welcome everyone. I'm uh, happy to be an honorary woman today. So thank you all for allowing me to participate with you. Um, the video that you just saw was actually uh, created for our landing of the Curiosity rover back in 2012, as you saw. And um, I also have to apologize for the mixture of English and metric units that, they were, that were in there. Uh, it was clearly created for American audiences who are not quite as far along with the metric system as, uh, as we like. Uh, but we have trained the engineers to go metric, so we're, we're slowly training them and they're getting there. Um, what you noticed from that video was that it really is hard to land on Mars. Uh, however, uh, as you may have heard, Curiosity did make it to the ground successfully uh, and has been operating on the surface of Mars for about five years. So the Mars Exploration Program at NASA has quite a, a history now of landing uh, successfully on Mars. And because of that, we've learned a lot about the surface of Mars, um, and we hope to learn more. So we're now currently planning another rover that we're going to send in 2020, and it's going to use the exact same landing system that uh, Curiosity used. So we know it worked the first time, and we are very certain that it will work the second time. So the great thing about the new rover, though, is um, that it will be a copy of Curiosity in terms of the chassis of the rover itself. So what you see here is an image of uh, the Mars 2020 rover uh, as it's currently envisioned to look when we finish building it. Uh, again, it's a copy of Curiosity in terms of the chassis, but we've selected all new instruments for it. Uh, and Dr. Allwood was selected as uh, the principal investigator of one of the investigations that will fly on Mars 2020. So I've worked with uh, Dr. Allwood quite a bit, and so I'll be able to uh, cover her material uh, after I give you a quick overview of what we're going to be doing on the Mars 2020 rover. So again, what you see here uh, is the rover. Uh, it has essentially seven scientific instruments on it, and I won't really go into detail on each of them because I could talk for hours about all of them and what great science they're going to do. Uh, but I'll point out that um, what we're interested in finding with this mission, as some of the speakers alluded to this morning, was finding uh, evidence in the rock record, in the rocks and the materials on the surface of Mars, uh, evidence that life may have left behind. If Mars was habitable in its early history, which we think it was, uh, we know from our experience here on Earth, like we see in Western Australia, that life leaves an imprint in the rocks. So you can tell that there were things alive uh, in that location that were preserved geologically through time that we can look at today. So we're hoping that if we go to the right landing site uh, and look for the right kinds of things with this mission that we'll be able to find some hints that there might be uh, what we're calling biosignatures or potential biosignatures in the rock record on the surface of Mars. So the instruments for the Mars 2020 mission were selected in order to give us a better understanding of 
the scale at which microorganisms live. So when you look at Mars today, we don't see any elephants walking around, we don't see any dinosaurs, we don't see anything like that, like we see here on Earth. We don't even see any plants or trees. Um, and so we think that if life did start on Mars, uh, it didn't really get bigger than single-celled organisms. In fact, most of the life on planet Earth is actually in the form of microorganisms as well. It's just that you're more used to seeing uh, things from a human perspective, and so we talk about elephants and whales and all that kind of stuff because they're what we call charismatic macrofauna, or you know, really cute, big things. Uh, but most of the biomass on Earth is actually single-celled organisms. So we think, from our experience, what we know about life on Earth, that life on Mars probably would have existed in much the same way. Tara Jokic this morning uh, gave a great introduction to the kinds of things that we expect to learn about Mars from our experience at looking at similar kinds of rock deposits on Earth, on early Earth. And so this is what NASA is interested in finding out for Mars. So the instruments, again, are designed to give us a very good sense for the scale at which these microorganisms, or they're called microorganisms because they're microscopic and you can't see them without a microscope. And so the instruments will actually get us down to the scale that these microorganisms actually live. So we'll be able to do chemistry measurements uh, on a very fine scale. We'll be able to take pictures that get us down to a very fine scale. And we'll be able to do uh, a lot of different things that will give us the context of those rocks in terms of um, where microorganisms might live. So with that introduction, um, one of the instruments that we have selected for uh, the Mars 2020 rover is an instrument called PIXEL, uh, which is, again, being led by Dr. Allwood. And so I would like to um, go through her presentation now, and then I'll be happy to take any questions about either her instrument or the Mars 2020 rover mission in general, or in anything about Mars exploration uh, at all. So. Uh, this is the title slide for Dr. Allwood. Uh, she is actually at our Jet Propulsion Laboratory, um, which is out in Pasadena, California, and that is where they're actually building uh, the rover itself. So not only is uh, Dr. Allwood there building her instrument, but that's where they're actually putting together uh, the rover for us. So we, through a process where we have invited the scientific community to um, make comments and to provide uh, scientific knowledge and that sort of thing, we have, select, we have chosen three final candidate landing sites for where we're going to send the Mars 2020 rover. So again, remember that we're interested in finding potential past signs of life on Mars. So we have to also evaluate the landing sites very carefully to look at their geology as best we can from orbit in order to understand the kinds of environments we think we see on the surface of Mars so that we can select what we think will be the best landing site for the Mars 2020 mission. So again, it's going to be able to land uh, actually very precisely using the system that you saw in the video. And so the what we call the landing ellipse, or the area where we expect to, to uh, put the rover onto the surface of Mars, is a, an oval about uh, 10 by 12 kilometers. We also have a couple of um, new technology developments that we did not have with Curiosity rover when we landed that, that will actually be able, probably, for us to make that uh, landing ellipse a little bit smaller, so we'll be able to get really nice and close to the rocks that we think are really interesting on Mars. Uh, one is called uh, range trigger, and that just means that they'll be able to fire the parachute after guiding the uh, spacecraft through the atmosphere. They'll be able to um, tell where they are on Mars and be able to trigger the parachute at the right time so that we can get really close. The other development is what's known as terrain relative navigation, we call TRN. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of images like you see here. Uh, this is a, an area on Mars called Jezero Crater. And we're going to take a bunch of images. So for example, if we select Jezero Crater as the landing site, we'll take a bunch of really high resolution images from orbit. We'll load those images onto the rover into the software. And the rover, as it comes down, when it's landing on Mars, will be able to compare what it sees with its cameras and its radar to the images that are preloaded. So if there are any big obstacles in the way, we'll be able to divert the spacecraft away from those areas so that we, we don't hit anything big. 
So that's another really great development that's going to actually allow us to get a lot closer to the rocks we really want to see when we get to Mars. So, again, this is uh, actually Dr. Allwood's favorite landing site. Uh, again, there are three candidates, uh, Jezero Crater, Northeast Sirtis, and Columbia Hills. Each of those sites um, is similar in the sense that they're on Mars, and they represent an area uh, that is relatively ancient from Mars's past, because we want to go back to the rocks when we think life was at or near the surface to look at. Um, they're all slightly different, however, in terms of the kinds of environments that they um, represent. So Jezero Crater, uh, again, Dr. Allwood's favorite, is what's called a delta. So there's a crater that was created by an impact. From looking at orbital images, like we see in this next one, uh, we see that what these colors represent are different kinds of mineralogy, different kinds of minerals that we see in the surface materials at Mars. So what you see here is the edge of the crater, uh, and you see this big, long, winding thing coming out, and then uh, an area that sort of has another little small crater in the side of it. So what happened was there was a standing body of water that developed inside this crater, and a river channel flowed into that crater, into that standing body of water, and it created a delta. So the great thing about deltas, um, so the famous example here on Earth, of course, is the Mississippi River Delta in the United States. It collects material from a great wide area and deposits, deposits it, concentrates it all in one location. And so that's a great place to go if you're looking for material from a wide variety of kinds of terrain that the river is draining and bringing all into one place. The other thing we know about deltas is that it's really good at uh, preserving organic compounds. So if you go to the Gulf of Mexico and you take a drill pipe and you drill into the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the Gulf of Mexico is very good at producing oil, as an example. And that's because the organic material collects from a great area and is all deposited in the same location. So it's also really good at preserving that organic material. Organic material is one of the hallmarks that we think is a good potential biosignature for life on Mars. So if, you're want, if you want to find organic material on Mars, a delta is a really great place to go because the material would have collected there um, from a variety of areas. So moving on, um, when we get to the ground on Mars, this is the kind of thing we expect to see in terms of the sedimentology uh, of the rocks on Mars. This is an Im image actually taken from uh, Opportunity. So just so everyone knows, not only is Curiosity still working on the surface of Mars five and a half years after it landed, Opportunity, which landed on Mars in January of 2004, is also still doing science on Mars. So it's been up there for 13 and a half years, driving around, doing some great science for us. So this is an image that shows that on the surface of Mars, there are rocks that are sedimentary in nature. And so this is one of the great kinds of environments that we um, know that organisms live in here and that we think might uh, have hosted life uh, in Mars's past. So the, um, this is an artist's depiction of what Jezero Crater may have looked like at the time uh, that it was you know, a little bit warmer and wetter on the surface of Mars. So you see the river coming in from the top left part of the corner uh, of the picture there and flowing into the standing body of water uh, in the crater lake. And so again, you see that the, the deposits would be made there right where the river pours into the, uh, into the standing body of water in the crater. Now, you've already sort of seen this. This is how we're going to get uh, Mars 2020 to the ground, just like we did with Curiosity. So this is called the Sky Crane, uh, where it has the great jetpacks over the top, and it lowers it down on the cables. Uh, and again, we'll be able to get really, really close to um, the rocks that we really want to see. So one of the things that the scientific community is really looking at very hard is each of these landing sites and the kinds of environments they represent, but also where in those particular landing sites you would want to put the rover on the ground so that you wouldn't have to drive as far to be able to get there to start taking your first measurements. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out about the Mars 2020 rover that makes it different than uh, the Mars Science Lab or the Curiosity rover that we sent before is that it will have actually a, sim a system uh, in the rover that will be able to take core samples of the rocks. So they'll actually be able to take samples of the Martian surface, the rocks at the Mars surface, put them in tubes and seal them up, and then we're hoping to be able to send another robotic mission to go pick those up later and bring those samples back to Earth. 
So it's very important for us in terms of being to, able to do the operations on the surface of Mars that we are able to um, get to things relatively quickly because the process of characterizing the environment, looking with the instruments for potential biosignatures, finding the rocks that we actually want to take samples of, it's a long involved process that is going to involve a lot of different scientists uh, and so we want to be able to get as close as we possibly can to the rocks that we really think we want to go see. Now, another, uh, one of the other things that we'll be able to do with the uh, Mars 2020 rover is use this instrument at the top of the mast, which is known as SuperCam. And what you see there is, super, is um, a picture of SuperCam uh, shooting a laser. So it has a laser beam in, built into the top of the mast. That laser beam will hit the rocks and vaporize the material. And by looking with a, what's known as a spectrometer or a light measuring device that's built into the mast, we'll be able to tell the chemistry of the rocks uh, from relatively far away. So if we see some rocks up at the top and we think they'll be interesting, we can hit it with the laser, figure out what kind of chemistry those rocks have and determine whether we think we should go investigate them even further. Now, the instrument that Dr. Allwood is providing for the Mars 2020 mission, uh, by the way, she is the first female uh, PI of an instrument that's being flown to Mars, so kudos to Dr. Allwood for that. <laughs> very exciting, and we're very happy to have her uh, as the PI of this instrument. This is her instrument. It's called PIXEL, or the Planetary Instrument for X-ray Lithochemistry. And essentially what that means is that we'll be using X-rays, so generate X-rays from a voltage, a high power supply, shoot X-rays into the rocks. When the X-rays interact with the materials in the rocks, it causes the electrons to move around in various different ways. When those electrons move around, they send off a signal. And those signals of the energy that, those, that the atoms are sending back is very diagnostic of the chemistry or the elemental composition of that rock. The great thing about Dr. Allwood's instrument is that it will allow us to be able to do that on a scale of about 100 microns. So 100 micrometers, we'll be able to see the chemistry. So for example, if you've all seen rocks that have big blobs in them, but they are like veins running through them, we'll be able to tell the difference between the composition of the rock and the veins that are inside those rocks. So we'll be able to separate out that signal. Again, this is very important because that's the scale at which the microorganisms live. So what you see here in this particular image um, are what we call chemical maps. Uh, so this is essentially a test of the capability of her instrument. And so each of those boxes, the colors in those boxes represent a different element. So at the top left is calcium, and then below that is man manganese, and then below that is chromium, and so forth. So there are particular kinds of elements that microorganisms use, some more than others. And so when we see concentrations of particular elements, that gives us clues that microorganisms might have been present in that particular kind of uh, environment. So these maps are very useful for helping us identify areas that we need to look at in a little bit more detail to try and understand uh, whether these rocks might have hosted uh, life. Now, the reason that um, we're interested in Mars, part of the reason we're interested in Mars, is because we think that early in Mars's history, as um, Tara talked about this morning, um, Mars had a thicker atmosphere, it was a little bit warmer, and we do see evidence that there was liquid water at the surface. Liquid water is not stable now, so it's a very cold, dry desert presently. But way in the past, we see evidence for river channels and all kinds of great stuff. So we think, again, that Mars might have been much more like Earth. Uh, and therefore, again, based on what we know about the rocks here on early Earth, uh, we think that Mars might have been habitable, just like Earth was. So this is why we're interested in exploring Mars. Um, and the kinds of rocks that we expect to see um, are represented. I know you guys all saw the stromatolites today as you were doing the activities, right? So this is an example of the stromatolites also from Western Australia. And so if we see something like, a, like this on Mars, we'll be very excited. Uh, we'll want to study these rocks in great detail and probably um, you know, take a few samples of these to hopefully bring back to study in much more powerful laboratories here on Earth someday. And I think that is it. So thank you all for your attention.
We'll move to a few questions with Dr. Schulte before going on to um, meet Tamara. Um, does anyone have a question? If you do, please raise your hand. There's one here. Can we get a microphone down here? Thank you. And for anyone online, feel free to join us on Slido and type in your question to us. Um, if Mars did have a thicker atmosphere and water, what happened to it? So that's a really good question. Um, so we think that what happened, and we actually have a spacecraft in orbit right now that's investigating exactly that question. It's called the MAVEN mission. And what we've learned from the MAVEN mission is that we think because Mars didn't, doesn't have a sustained magnetic field like Earth does, that essentially the solar wind has come and knocked essentially all the atmosphere off of Mars. And so it's uh, the, the very powerful particles coming from the sun and because Mars isn't protected by a magnetic field, it was able to strip away a lot of the gas in the atmosphere. Two. One more question. There at the back. Towards the back. If they were to find life on Mars in this new mission, what would that mean for science in the future? Well, so what we're, what we're looking for with this mission, just to be clear, is evidence of past life. So evidence in the rock record. Um, if we do find that kind of information, then obviously we would want to probably go back to study Mars in more detail and try and figure out where on Mars, why we think life was there, what kinds of environments were there, did it um, have a big impact on the surface materials, that kind of thing. Uh, it also would give us a little bit of hope that life might still exist on Mars probably doesn't exist anywhere near the surface, so it would be a difficult problem to actually go find extant life or living life on Mars right now. But if we found evidence that it was there in the past, that would give us hope um, that it might still exist there. Thank you. For those of you with your hands up, can we save your questions to the... We have a long, much longer Q&A session um, after our next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor Tamara Davis. She's a cosmologist at the University of Queensland. She now is helping lead the Australian Dark Energy Survey, measuring thousands of supernovae and hundreds of supermassive black holes. The aim is to understand our fundamental laws of nature and to try to figure out the nature of dark energy, which is causing the expansion of, our un of the universe to accelerate. To tell us more about what's next, infinity and beyond. Please welcome Professor Tamara Davis. Hi everybody, it's really exciting to be here at the Opera House for a fantastic science event. I think the last time I was on show, doing a show here was actually when I was in high school and um, we were here for an Estedford. Um, very different type of event, so it's fantastic to have a science event here at the Opera House, I think, especially a women in science event. Uh, I'm a, a local from around here. I grew up in Coogee. Um, I went to St. Catherine's School nearby went and um, went to University of New South Wales for my undergraduate and PhD. And somehow, um, after basically spending my, my teenage years enjoying going, like being in the surf club and doing gymnastics and swimming and things like that, I somehow ended up becoming an astrophysicist. Uh, so I went the things that I'll, I'll tell you about today is a little bit about the kinds of research that I do. Uh, basically, I, I study cosmology. So I study the universe as a whole, try and understand the laws of gravity, try and understand the fundamental laws of particle physics that govern our universe, and bring all that knowledge back to under, so understanding how um, all the processes of, of, of Earth work together. Uh, now, there's been, so we're basically going quite a bit further away than looking at Mars when we look at these kinds of things. The smallest thing that I tend to look at is an entire galaxy. Uh, and when we look at the universe as a whole, we've discovered a couple of really surprising things. Now, two of the surprising things are here, uh, dark matter and dark energy. We've known about dark matter basically since the moment we realised galaxies existed. People looked at how fast they were moving and were like, hold on a second, they're moving way too fast to be able to explain their motion just by the gravity of the stars and dust and gas and things that we see. So not only the galaxies moving around in clusters of galaxies, but also how fast they spin indicates that there's uh, something else holding them together. That thing we call dark matter, we don't yet know what, we're, what it is, 
but we're trying to measure its properties in much more detail so we can figure out uh, what it's made of. We think that it makes up 25% of the entire energy of the universe. So it's quite important. Dark energy might be even more important because it makes up, we think, 70% of the universe, which means that the stuff that makes up you and I, the atoms that you study, things where you look at the periodic table and, and things, all of that kind of stuff only makes up maybe 5% of the energy of the universe. It's just sort of the icing on the cake. It's, if we forget about dark energy and dark matter, we're missing out on the entire cake. So I try and study the cake, but we can only look at the icing. We can only see the galaxies. So we have to infer the existence of dark matter and dark energy by watching um, the things that we can see. Now, I, I liken this a bit to, like, if you think about it, if you think back 200 years, we didn't know what the air was. We didn't have a particle theory of matter. We didn't know what the periodic table was. We didn't know what carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and things like that were. We didn't know what the air was, but we could tell it was there because we could see the leaves of trees um, being blown around, right? There's something that we're breathing. Uh, and we're in that state with dark energy and dark matter at the moment. We can see that they're there, but we don't know what they are. So I was going to give you a quick intro into the kinds of things, why, what, what, how we know that they're there, uh, and, um, and why we're so certain, so certain they're there. So let's check out this. This is an incredible image. Has anyone seen this before? Yeah, can anyone tell me what this is? Yep, the, the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, this one is. This is um, a picture of empty space. This is what you get if you take the Hubble Space Telescope and you point it at a blank piece of sky. You point it at a piece of sky where there's noth nothing there. There's no stars, there's no galaxies. But you leave the shutter open for 11 days. As you take an 11-day photo, you begin to see all of these faint things that were just too faint to see before. And so what you see is this beautiful array of galaxies. Pretty much everything that you see there is another galaxy, like our Milky Way. So you know that our, um, our Earth orbits our sun. Our sun's only one of hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy. Our galaxy is only one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in the observable universe. And the observable universe is what I'm trying to study. So here. It used to be that, um, you know, when I t admit that I'm an astrophysicist, people often say, so what do you do? Do you, like, discover galaxies or something like that? And I'm like, well, discovering galaxies is actually really easy. All you do is you point your telescope at a patch of sky that people haven't, and, and look for longer than anyone else has looked before, and voila, you see more galaxies. Um, but with images like this, that's almost no longer true. Um, you can actually... Uh, with images like this, we're looking so far back in time that we're looking back to before the era when galaxies even existed. So remember that video at the start? We talked about the fact it takes light 14 minutes, um, about 14 minutes, depending on where Mars is, to get from Mars to Earth. It takes um, eight point, um, uh, about just a bit over eight minutes for the light to get from the sun to us. It takes about four years for light to get from the nearest other star to us. The light that we're looking at in this image has taken more than 12 and a half billion years to get to us in the most distant objects in here. And to put that in perspective, remember that the Earth is only four and a half billion years old. The light that you're looking at in this picture was emitted <coughs> by these galaxies before the Earth even formed. I think that's absolutely astonishing. So the power of our modern telescopes is huge, and I think the, the best, most sort of visual way of being able to see that is this sort of next um, video. This is just pretending that we're watching a supernova going off in a distant galaxy, but this is a real image from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is the deep field, not the ultra-deep field. And as it zooms out, what you're looking at is it gets superimposed on other images from other cameras with wider fields of view. And as you zoom out, and you zoom out, and you zoom out, you get some sort of sense for just how far our modern telescopes can see. So this, uh, I said that we can't see any further back, that any galaxies further than, for that you can see in this image, basically because we're looking so far back in time that galaxies didn't exist. But we can actually see light that has come further. And that's this. 
This is light from the Big Bang itself, essentially. This is the cosmic microwave background. It was emitted 380,000 years after the Big Bang, which is really early. It was emitted from when the entire universe was as hot and dense as, a, as the inside of our star, uh, inside of our sun. So you're basically looking here at a picture of like slight hot spots and cold spots that um, from an almost uniform background of light that's coming from all directions, which is the remnant light that's left over from the very early glow of the universe. And the really cool thing about this is that, you know, sound, wave do sounds don't, sound does not travel in space now. It's a vacuum. Um, so you don't, get sound, you don't hear anything if you're in the vacuum of space. Back then, if you were back at the very early universe, sound was traveling everywhere. The universe was so dense that it was this mass, it was ringing like a bell. There were massive sound waves. And these hot and cold spots here are basically compressions and rarefractions of a sound wave. The cool thing is from that is that where the, when this was emitted and um, as the universe expanded and we, the sound waves weren't able to travel anymore, the places that were compressions and falling into compressions, that's where galaxies formed. So what we've done is we took the, um, the, this initial conditions, these beginnings, chuck them into a supercomputer and see in the expanding universe how stuff collapses and forms galaxies from, a real, from those initial conditions. So we predicted what we were going to be able to see. And then we went to what you're looking at here, all of these green dots is basically clumps of dark matter um, forming into clumps that would end up forming galaxies. That's a big cluster of galaxies that's forming in the centre and something like our Milky Way would be like one of the little pu puffs on the outskirts. So we can now predict and then what we would see at the present day. And we went out and we measured the pattern of galaxies in the universe and lo and behold it matched the prediction. It goes a really big confirmation that dark, the amount of dark matter and dark energy and stuff that we thought that is out there is actually what, what really is out there. But yet there is more. <laughs> there, is a, there is another way in which you can measure um, that dark matter is out there, and that's that light gets bent as it passes by something that's really heavy. So in this case, what you're seeing here is lending a background galaxy emits light in all sorts of directions, and we actually can see that galaxy by light that has traveled different paths to get here. So this is an image here where there's a cluster of galaxies in the foreground. Those are the red ones. And there's a blue galaxy in the background, and you can see several copies of the blue galaxy by light that has taken a different route to get here. So it looks like there's quite a few blue galaxies in the outskirts here. They're all the same galaxy. They're just, we're seeing that galaxy by light that has come from a different route because the light gets bent on its travels towards us. This is another example. I don't know if you can see, there's sort of like these red arcs. There's a few background galaxies in this one. And so the, Thing, the cool thing about this is that we can use the shapes of the background galaxies to detect the presence of dark matter in the foreground, even though we can't see the dark matter. Because again, the, the, the light wouldn't be bent that much if there wasn't dark matter to bend the light. Um, the normal matter in there is not, not nearly sufficient to be able to do this. So all of the light from every single background galaxy has to sort of ride the roller coaster of curved space to get to us. And really recently, just like Friday week ago, um, uh, a team that I'm helping um, lead called the Dark Energy Survey um, is uh, made this, produced this map, which is the map of the distribution of dark matter in the sort of semi-recent universe. It's the most detailed map of the distribution of dark matter that's ever been made. Uh, and it was really exciting and cool to be able to um, release this. This is made by watching 26 million galaxies and how their shapes were changed on the way to, to reach us. Uh, yeah, it was super exciting. Um, this dark energy survey that I'm helping to manage now is um, a team of uh, over 400 scientists from um, uh, six continents. Um, it, we had made a sort of a map of where we all are from. And these, the dots that you see on this map are different collaborators that helped in building this map. So science is a really international endeavour. And we've got about 30 Aussies involved in this massive international team that's making some of the most precise measurements ever of things like dark matter and dark energy in the universe. So with that, I should leave it there. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to open up the floor to questions, but we might start with two questions for um, Tamara, and then we'll open up to, to questions to both Mitch and Tamara. Would you raise your hand if you have a question for Tamara? Or online? There's one over here. Across there? 
Can we get a microphone this way, please? Thank you. Um, so all of this like dark energy, dark matter stuff, is that the sort of thing you learn uh, like in, at a bachelor's level or do you have to get up to like post-grad to be able to learn this sort of thing? If you stud study astrophysics at university, you definitely will study that. Uh, there's basically no way that you can study the universe without studying dark energy and dark matter because otherwise you get all your calculations for things like galaxies completely wrong. Yeah. So look forward to it very soon. I don't know whether you get to learn about it at high school. We've got a question online. Go ahead, Scarlett. Yes, we have a live audience here. She's asking Tamara, as a female scientist, what would you like your legacy to be? I would like my legacy to be awesome science. <laughs> I, um, it's, uh, it's really interesting that to be... I, it, I never have felt any type of discrimination or anything like that. Being a female scientist, I've never felt anything but enthusiastic support from all of my colleagues. And I think um, science is one of the most fantastic careers in the world. I have an absolute ball doing it. And all I really hope is that um, as the, my contribution to science is going to be something that's, that's true and solid and lasting and, some, and we discover something new and exciting about the universe. I would also like to, um, I guess, encourage more females into science and uh, I be a, a role model and mentor for as, as many up-and-coming scientists as I can possibly be. We'll, we'll now open up the floor to questions to both Mitch and Tamara. So ask away. Can we get a microphone one down well. here? Or there's someone here. Over? Some new oh, people. Here we go. <laughs> Um, what's the difference between dark matter and dark energy? Yes, very good question. So dark matter pulls. It's, it has, uh, we think it's most likely a particle. It clumps and it's, it's the, se the sort of the seed in which all of galaxies form. Uh, dark ma energy, on the other hand, it pushes. It appears to have some sort of repulsive gravity. It's accelerating the entire expansion of the universe. Um, it was, wasn't discovered until the um, 1990s. Uh, the guys that, um, the teams that discovered it are, um, ended up winning the Nobel Prize for it in 2011. And that was really fun because I work with these teams and um, it was discovered using supernovae. Um, they, they discovered it before I, I joined the teams, but I still got to go to Stockholm and go to some, some parties for the, um, for the Nobel Prize winning <laughs> um, celebrations. Although not, not the, the, main, the main ones, but they got to meet the royalty. But anyway, it was, uh, it's... Dark energy is really bizarre because it's a little bit like um, if I uh, throw this up in the air, it comes back down, right? If I was to throw this up in the air at 11 kilometers per second, I'd have to go to the gym. Um, if I throw it at 11 kilometers per second, in the absence of a ceiling and air resistance, it'll escape Earth and never come back. So when they went out to measure the, the expansion of the universe, they thought that um, we thought that gravity should be slowing the expansion down. The universe is expanding, the galaxies are moving away from each other, but they should be attracting each other for gravity, and so it should be slowing down. Even if this has the escape velocity, it slows down as it's going up. What they discovered was more like, I throw this gently into, um, up, and it accelerates off into space. Something out there is pushing the galaxies, not pulling. We don't know what it is. We call it dark energy, and we're trying to measure it more precisely so we can figure out what it is. Questions? Here, here, We've got a few here. here. We'll take these two questions and then come to the question online. Um, okay. So both of you work in like this, like in space, and well, like looking out at. I space. wish I worked in space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's like really cool to think about it, like how like most of us sort of always think about earthly things, but you guys tend to look out into that area and I was just wondering does it ever shock you to like think back at like how small and how insignificant that we are and like in, and like it's like um because you see like especially you, you see all these like distant galaxies and you see like so much space mm -hmm. and do you ever think that there could be other things out there who could be similar to us? Absolutely. I, I, get, I often get asked, hold on, you, 
doesn't looking at all of that stuff make you feel really small? But I'm like, we were talking about microbial life and stuff before, and I'm as small compared to a galaxy as I am big compared to a quark or the nucleus of, like, inside a nucleus of an atom. So I figure I'm about Goldilocks size. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is something that you think about. It, I think it definitely puts, it ma makes sort of petty squabbles and things that you have on Earth sort of pale into insignificance compared to what happens out there. It also gives you a really important perspective about the preciousness of Earth. Like you saw M Mars, Mars lost its atmosphere because it didn't have a, a strong enough magnetic field. If the, uh, the habitability of other planets um, is, is a real challenge. Like, like, we are basically designed to take advantage of what Earth has. If we, we destroy Earth's atmosphere and Earth's climate, then we don't have any easy planets to get to, even if we get to Mars. It's, or, did, has anyone here seen Interstellar, the movie? Yeah, if, you know, no matter how good our physics becomes and what fancy things we have to get to other planets, the take-home message from that, that her, get, living on other, the other planets are always, almost guaranteed to be more crap than Earth when we get there. So let's look after this planet. That's my pers perspective from looking at the universe. And I would just say that um, obviously a lot of scientists think that there could be you know, life beyond Earth, otherwise we wouldn't be looking for it or spending so much time thinking about it. Um, one of the things we have to remember, though, is that what we see on Earth helps guide us, but there could be things out there that we're just we're completely blown away by and don't even really know. Um, but we do have to follow, there have to, life would still have to follow certain rules. You can't violate the laws of physics, you can't violate the laws of chemistry, all that kind of stuff. So it's very important to remember to keep grounded in those kinds of things, and that actually helps you expand your knowledge, I think. Mm -hmm. You. We had a question at the front here. Um, so, with NASA's discovery of like um, Trappist One earlier this year, so like exoplanets and things like that, what do you think that means for like how we as humans can extend ourselves further into the discovery of like more galaxies and more solar systems and like things out there in the universe? Do you want to start with that one? I, th it's, I think it's super exciting. The, um, like the Kepler spacecraft has now discovered thousands of planets around other stars. And one of the really exciting things about that is it just looks like planets are everywhere, right? And the thing with these, some of these is they're transiting planets. So they, we see them by the fact that they periodically dim the star. They do like a mini little eclipse. They, we see the dimming of the star. I'm really excited by the possibility that some of, if those planets have atmospheres, some of the light from that star as it comes towards us will go through those atmospheres and we can take a spectrum, figure out what the atmosphere is made of. And the next generation of telescopes are trying to do that to look for... We, we're now in the stage where we really genuinely can ask, is there life on other planets? Because if we find something like free oxygen, O2, that's something that uh, doesn't stay in an atmosphere for long. It, it will burn, it will rust, it will, it, it will tend to be used up. So if we see something like that, something is producing it, um, that thing might be life. So I find it really exciting that we're in the position where we might, we can really scientifically look and see and uh, try and detect life on other planets. Yeah, Kepler opened a whole can of worms. There's all kinds of different kinds of planets out there all around all different kinds of stars. And uh, it just gives you a sense that there are a lot of things out there and we have a lot of work to do. So study hard and yeah. help us out. <laughs> yeah. We need some workers. Um, we're just going to take a question from our online audience now. Yeah, we have a question from James Shahan High School located in Orange. The question is, how can we improve our methods of transportation to make a trip to Mars quicker and more feasible? So getting to Mars is um, really not that difficult. Uh, one of the great things is that it takes Mars two of our years to go around the sun once takes us obviously one year. So every couple of years we have a, what we call a, a launch opportunity when Mars and Earth actually get relatively close together. So we try and take advantage of those opportunities and launch a mission to Mars as often as we can every couple of years. It doesn't take as much power or mass um, or time when you do that. So when we send rovers, if we hit the window right, then it takes about seven, eight, nine months to get to Mars. Um, 
we're sort of limited in the uh, speed at which we can send things because mostly what we still use are chemical rockets and you can only get a certain amount of energy out of that. But we are working on technologies that will uh, essentially constantly accelerate a spacecraft. Uh, and what that means is that you, once you get the momentum and you keep building on it, then you can go faster and faster and faster. So um, we are working on that kind of thing, but we are a little bit limited in the, in the, uh, the things that we can do right now. We have a question at the back, just over there, and then that will be the next question. Hi. Uh, do you see in any near, near future we sending any living organisms to Mars, however small they might be microscopic, just to see whether they can exist there and whether it is a sign that there might be life somewhere else in Mar on Mars? So actually we try very hard not to send microorganisms to Mars because if there is life there, we don't want to contaminate the planet and have something that we sent there take over. Uh, that would also really screw up our signals for determining what is actually Martian and what is something that we brought with us. So we're required to undergo what is called planetary protection for our missions. And so we're limited in the amount of um, organic material and microorganisms that we can send on a spacecraft. Um, I think at the moment, largely, we're fairly safe because, again, most um, organisms on Earth, well, in fact, all organisms on Earth need liquid water, and there really isn't any at the surface of Mars, so it'd be kind of difficult to sort of screw up Mars in that way, but we, we have to be careful because there are patches of uh, ground ice, for example, and if you drive the rover or smash the rover too close to that, then you could induce liquid water to form and you could contaminate the planet. So we have to be very careful about that thing, that kind of thing. So um, we actually try very hard not to send microorganisms to Mars. Okay, great. We had a question over there in the corner. Um, with the photos that had uh, repeating galaxies in the background, how are you able to find the true source of where the light is actually from before the repeats? Excellent question. Um, I wonder, I guess we can, I don't know if I can move back, but when you see those multiple images of the galaxies, you don't actually see the original one. Like there's, there's, no, there's no true original um, galaxy um, there. You see only these, these versions that the, the light came around. So what you can do though is you can measure, uh, use the, the pattern to see how much mass would be, be there and figure out where it would have been in the past. And generally, that this you see most of them when the, the lens, so the big patch of dark matter with clumps of galaxies inside it, um, is about halfway between us and the, and the distant galaxy. That's when that uh, lensing is most efficient and we get the, the sort of, it's easiest to make those images. Yeah. We just have one question here and then uh, the last one online will be our last question. Um, this one's for Mitchell. So you said you have like three places you're going to look for life in, and if you say you don't find any, is there like a definitive end to the search, or do we just keep going? Uh, we hope not. Um, just because we didn't find it there doesn't mean it wasn't there somewhere on Mars. It's sort of like um, trying to land a spacecraft in the middle of the outback somewhere and not finding anything and then deciding, well, this place is dead, so we shouldn't look here anymore, right? So. Um, this is part of the scientific process that you constantly are looking, challenging your assumptions about things, but still trying to explore and um, not taking no for an answer. So, We have one last question online. Yeah, we have a very good question here. So, um, student asks, does Australia play a role in the Mars mission and how can I, as a student, get involved? So it's really too bad that Abby is not here. Uh, she is our resident Australian uh, on the Mars 2020 mission, and we're very happy to have her. Um, we are happy to work with anyone. Uh, there are lots of programs that NASA has, uh, postdoctoral fellowships and that kind of thing, where you can come to work at NASA centers, even as someone from Australia. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to get involved in uh, Mars missions and NASA in general. 
And in fact, we have two instruments that are being provided for the Mars 2020 mission that were provided by foreign countries. So we have a contribution from Spain uh, and a contribution from Norway. And uh, the French are actually building part of that SuperCam instrument that I talked about before. So we get a lot of, uh, a lot of great things from everywhere in the world, and we're happy to have that. So, and we're very proud of Abby. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you to both our speakers. Um, it's been such an exciting and inspiring day for all of us. Um, and I'd like you to join me in a round of applause for our speakers this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you also to um, the people who made this event uh, possible. Inspiring Australia, the Sydney Science Festival, the Big Questions Institute, as well as my wonderful team um, from UNSW Science, and of course, the wonderful people at the Sydney Opera House. Remember that science has the power to take you anywhere, from the centre of the earth to the furthest reaches of deep space. Thank you. <laughs>